Well, I'm very pleased to be back here at the Refreshing Water Renewal, a good Bible conference, and I'm happy to have you as my conferees, the attendees of this annual event that all believe that God is real, the Bible is true, Jesus is alive and dwells in our hearts by faith. The Holy Spirit is our helper who empowers us, where the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church divine, and somewhere beyond the stars is our everlasting home in heaven. Amen. I just happen to have a book by the title. <laughs> what a terrible way to mention this book, but Beyond the Stars, Our Home in Heaven. This came out right after I preached here last year. I don't think it was available. I have the last eight copies. We have new copies coming in, and uh, if you want one of these, see me afterwards tonight. Before I uh, get into the message tonight, uh, we have somewhat of an anniversary here, not necessarily a good one. Forty-five years ago, Time Magazine on the cover, Is God Dead? And now, 45 years later, on the cover of Time, what? if there's no hell. And um, the subtitle is, A Popular Pastor's Best-Selling Book Has Stirred Fierce Debate About Sin, Salvation, and Judgment. If you've been following this story, you know that this is not a Unitarian, liberal, Protestant minister. It is an evangelical minister named Rob Bell who has a 7,000 member church in Michigan, who has written a book in which he suggests that the redemptive work of Jesus may be universal, meaning that every person who ever lived could have a place in heaven. Now, it takes Time Magazine, one of the most liberal magazines in my time, to rebuke Rob Bell. For this is what John Meacham wrote in his article covering this story. From a traditionalist perspective, though, to take away hell is to leave the church without a powerful sanction. If heaven, however defined, is everyone's ultimate destination in any event, then what's the incentive to confess Jesus as Lord in this life? If, in other words, Gandhi is in heaven, then why bother with accepting Christ? If you say the Bible doesn't really say what a lot of people have said it says, then where does that stop? If the verses about hell and judgment aren't literal, what about the ones on adultery or homosexuality? This is Time Magazine rebuking Mr. Bell. Taken to their logical conclusions, such questions could undermine much of conservative Christianity. Now that's the world in which we live today. But I have a text tonight that talks about sin, and we're going to be looking at it in just a moment. I was doing a little study on this subject of sin uh, before I started the actual preparation of this message, because that is a key word in this text. And incidentally, it is misspelled in your program. It says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's singular, okay? Just wanted to point that out. No offense to the typist. I've made many mistakes myself, whoever it was. I believe that the word sin probably appears in the Bible more than any other word except God itself. And that is because in the Hebrew language, there are eight different words for sin. And in the Greek language, there are 12 different words for sin. And when you start adding all of those up, you almost have to get a calculator after a while. But our text tonight says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 13 words that changed the world. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I've got five things I want to share with you tonight. And first of all, and they're all from this one verse, John 1, 29. 
The first is the setting. This text begins the next day. So this asks me to ask a question at least. Well, what happened the day before? If it says the next day, what happened the day before? Well, the day before, the Jews had set a delegation of priests and Levites from Jerusalem to John in Bethany to interrogate John the Baptist, a delegation bent on interrogation. And it was fast and furious. Look at the questions and answers. Question, who are you? Answer, I am not the Christ. Question, what then? Are you Elijah? Answer, I am not. Question, are you the prophet? Notice, not a prophet, but the prophet. Answer, no. Question, who are you then that we may give an answer to those who sent us? <laughs> what do you say about yourself? Answer, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. Amen. Question, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Answer, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. And then John the Apostle adds, this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. So that's the setting for our text. Secondly, the site. The next day, John saw something. What did he see? More properly stated, whom did he see? He saw Jesus coming toward him, which leads me to ask, where had he been? As near as I can tell from the parallel account in Luke, Jesus is returning from the three temptations. Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. Not just returning from the three temptations, but returning in the power of the Spirit. And that's how John saw Jesus coming toward him. Now, use your sanctified imagination here. This is like the grand opening of a play or a movie. John sees in the distance a figure on the horizon looming larger and larger and larger as he comes toward him. So if you were scoring the music for this dramatic scene, what score would you write? For after all, it is Jesus who is coming directly at you until at last you are face to face. Charles Lamb, and I find that somewhat ironic with my subject tonight on the Lamb of God, said, if William Shakespeare should enter this room tonight, we would all stand, but if Jesus Christ entered this room tonight, we would all kneel. Amen. We would fall to our knees. Why would we kneel? Because we see coming toward us Jesus. Now I'm going to have Rob flash on the screen here just a few of the 700 names and titles. I knew if I would go through all of these tonight, I would not have a voice left. And so I'm just going to take them. I selected some in alphabetical, but you can enjoy all of them. Here is Jesus coming towards us. But who is Jesus? He is the Ancient of Days. He is the Branch of Righteousness. He is the Christ of God. He is the desire of all nations. He is the ensign of the people. He is the faithful witness. He is the great high priest. He is the holy one of God. He is the I am. He is Jesus, the Son of God. He is the King eternal. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the Messenger of the New Covenant. He is the Nazarene. He is the only begotten of the Father. 
He is the prince of peace. He is the righteous judge. He is the seed of Abraham and also the seed of David and the seed of woman. He is the true vine and he is the word of life. Now I ask, what musical score would you write if you were scoring this as a drama, as a movie, as you see coming closer and closer until you are face to face with the one who is described in these terms that the Bible gives us tonight. I suggest to you that the musical score has already been written. You may have even sung it this week. Marshall Leggett calls it the national anthem of the Christian church. At least at one time it was. And it goes like this. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. This is the subject. This is the sight, rather, that John saw. Now, third, the surprise. You like a surprise? John does. And he says, behold. Now, the NIV and other newer translations has look. But personally, I think that is lacking in intensity and missing the majesty of the moment. Look, what does that mean? It can mean anything you want it to. In my opinion, the word look is too mundane and too commonplace and too shallow for the significance of the approach of the Savior of the world. Amen. The New King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, and the English Standard Version, which I really like, all use the word behold. But if you go back to the original language, the, in the Greek, this word is used as an interjection to denote surprise. Lo, behold. Today we might even say, ta-da, <laughs> to put it rather crudely. The word behold is used 1,275 times in the King James Version, 1,172 times in the New American Standard, and 1,061 times in the ESV, only six times in the NIV. I don't know why they chose to use look rather than behold. I'm not rebuking them, I'm just offering an observation. Because here are a dozen dramatic uses of behold in scripture. Malachi 3 verse 1, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. This is actually a reference to the one who says behold because it's a reference to John the Baptist. I like this one, Matthew 1 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This is spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Luke 1, 38. Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. This is Mary speaking to the angel Gabriel. Luke 2, 34. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. This is spoken by Simeon to the mother of Jesus, Mary. John 12, 15, Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. This is Zechariah's prophecy, fulfilled by Christ in the triumphal entry. Luke 22, 21, Behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. Jesus, in referencing Judas, John 19, 5, Pilate speaking to the crowd, Behold the man. Again in John 19, 14, this time to the crowd again, Behold your king. On the cross and from the cross, Jesus to his mother in John 19, 26, Woman, behold your son. And then to John the apostle, a verse later, Behold your mother. And then a loud voice from heaven in Revelation 21, 3. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with me, with men. And then in the last chapter of the Bible, verse 7. Jesus, behold, I am coming quickly. This is the element of surprise, you see. Behold, 
I've got some surprising news for you. And now we turn to the subject, fourthly, the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Not just a lamb, not behold a lamb, not just behold the lamb, but behold the Lamb of God. He could have introduced Jesus as a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he did not. He chose purposefully and with thought to introduce Jesus as the lamb, the paschal lamb, the sacrificial lamb, not just a sweet little lamb that you see out in the meadow eating daisies. The Lamb of God, this indicates that God anointed and appointed and approved his son to be a sacrificial lamb. When I was a little boy, my father tells me that I crawled into his study one day when he was preparing a sermon. And he looked up from his notes and he said to me, are you my little puppy? And I said, no, I'm your little lamb. And from that day forward, my father always referred to me as his lamb, his lamb boy. In fact, the last words I ever heard him speak included that intimate term, lamb boy. So with all reverence intended, this is what Jesus was to his father, his lamb boy. The son of God who became not just a cute little lamb, but a sacrificial lamb. J. Vernon McGee says, here we find fulfillment of the answer that Abraham had given to Isaac those many years ago. Isaac had said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? And Abraham said, my son, God himself will provide a lamb. And years later, God himself provided a lamb to take away the sin of the world. The word lamb in its singular usage is found over 100 times in scripture. It is found 16 times in the book of Leviticus, 22 times in the book of Numbers, but is found most often in the book of Revelation 30 times. And John in his gospel uses lambs at least a dozen times So John in his gospel and in the revelation of Jesus Christ mentions the lamb more than any other writer of the Bible. Lamb is his special word for Jesus. Now if you study Exodus 12 verses 5 and 6 carefully, you will note four striking similarities between the sacrificial lamb and the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Number one, Both were a male taken in their prime of life. Number two, both had to be without blemish. Number three, both were kept under constant scrutiny. And no man was ever more scrutinized than Jesus Christ. And yet they, even Pilate said, I find no fault in him. And number four, both were slain to save their people. J.W. McGarvey notes that according to Exodus 29 and verse 39, a lamb was sacrificed daily at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. And he notes the very hours that Jesus hung on the cross. Some students of the Bible believe that Jesus was crucified at the same time as the Passover lambs were being slaughtered in the temple. Joel Stephen Williams, whom I personally know, is one such student who says, the Gospel of John appears to have the Passover according one day later than the synoptics. Thus, Jesus is crucified at the same time in the afternoon as the Passover lambs are being slaughtered in the temple. He says it is difficult to draw any other conclusion from John's Gospel except that Jesus died at the same time as the Passover lambs were being slaughtered since he himself is our Passover lamb. Scholars will be debating the date of the Passover and the exact character of the Last Supper until the end of the world. But the truth that Jesus was crucified during the Passover season is beyond dispute. The unimpeachable, 
Um, the affirmation that the early church interpreted Jesus' death as a paschal sacrifice is unimpeachable. So Christians can raise their voices in unison with the utterance of John the Baptist and declare, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Now fifth, I call it the snatch. And that's a word that Jesus' brother Jude uses in his little epistle, verse 23, snatching them from the flames. This is the biggest seizure or snatch or taking away that you will ever hear of. At last, we come to the heart of the text, indeed the heart of all scripture. For the primary purpose of Jesus coming to earth was to take away the sin of the world. And I thought a lot about this as I've studied this. Why does John the Baptist use it in the singular and not in the plural? Perhaps sin is singular here in our text to indicate the massive collective burden that Jesus bore on the cross. John would later write, he himself is the propitiation or the covering for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Think of the people that have populated this planet. Jesus bore every one of their sins. So perhaps it's a collective burden, the sin of the world. No wonder he fell beneath the weight of the cross. Yes. It wasn't the weight of the cross. It was the weight of the sin of the world. Yes. He bore our sins in his body on the tree, Peter says. This is the collective and crushing sin of the world. Roy Lesson put it this way. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. Not that we don't need one right now in these times. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. And we have too many of those in the church today. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a Savior. He sent us the Lamb of God who takes away the sin Amen. of the world. Now, this act of atonement was no afterthought with God. Because in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 12, John the Revelator says, Jesus is not just the Lamb who was slain, though he uses that in other places, but in 5.12, he says, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, 13.8. Excuse me, I gave you the wrong reference. I apologize. The act of atonement was no afterthought with God. Amen. Slain from the foundation of the world. And why was he slain? Well, in the chorus to that great song, Seeking the Lost, W.A. Ogden tells us, Jesus the lamb for sinners slain. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, that Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. He is our Passover, and he was sacrificed for us. But as John says, not for us only, but for the sin of the whole world. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah painted a portrait of a lamb, saying... In that great 53rd chapter, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb. This is 700 years before he comes into the world and he's already painting a picture of Jesus as a sacrificial lamb, led as a lamb, not driven, but led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. 
He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. And here's the reason why. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted is how it goes in the old King James. So what we see in Isaiah 53 is the redemptive purpose of Jesus. And we see it in other passages in Isaiah 53 as well. Verse 5, he was wounded. Why? For our transgressions. He was bruised. Why? For our iniquities. If you want to personalize this sometime, read it this way. He was wounded for my transgressions. If you want to get more personal, he was wounded for Victor's transgressions. He was bruised for Victor's iniquities. That makes it more personal, doesn't it? Verse 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What a crushing collective weight. This is why he fell beneath the weight of the cross. Verse 10, Words hard for us as loving fathers to understand with Father's Day coming up. But it pleased the Lord to bruise him. When you make his soul an offering for sin. And verse 12, he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. An old song puts it this way. He took my sins and my sorrows, and he made them his very own. He took, that's the snatch, he took them away. That's why he came. Jesus takes away, notice present tense, doesn't say he took, says he takes away the sin of the world because his sacrifice is not only efficacious, but also perpetual. Brother McGarvey says, the fountain of his forgiveness never fails. Some to avoid the vicarious nature of Christ's sacrifice, quoting McGarvey here, claim that the Baptist means Jesus would gradually lift the world out of his sin by his teaching, but lambs do not teach and sin is not removed by teaching, but by sacrifice. Amen. And Jesus was sacrificed for the world, that is, for the entire human family in all ages. Now, all are bought, but all do not acknowledge the purchase price. He gives liberty to all, but all do not receive it. And some, having received it, return again to bondage. A Christian looks upon Christ as one who has taken away his past sin and who will forgive his present sin. That's why 1 John 1 and verse 9 is in the Bible, incidentally. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. That was not written to an alien sinner. That was written to New Testament Christians. And he is faithful. He is just to forgive us of all our transgressions. I believe that the sin of the world today is to reject the Christ of God, the gift of God. That is the great sin of the world. I know that's true because John 1.10 says, He came to his own and his own did not receive him. If you don't receive him, you reject him for all practical purposes. Jesus takes away the sin of the world through a once for all shedding of blood sacrifice on Calvary. This is the spot in the universe where it took place. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. Where? At Calvary, not at Medina, not at Mecca, not at Los Angeles, not at New York, not in New Delhi, but at Calvary. You can literally go there today and stand there 
That's where I was supposed to be this week until all this affliction came upon me. The writer of Hebrews makes this abundantly clear. 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. 9.25 and following, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, think how God long. I think how long God waited until this happened for us. He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. 10.10, by that will... We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is again and again and again. There's an old song, once for all. Don't think it's in our hymn books now, but it should be. It's a good one. 10, 12, and 14. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's why you see so many pictures of the crucifixion all around the world. That's why you hear so many beautiful uh, um, poems written about this one event. That's why most of the songs in our hymn book are written about this great event. It is no wonder to me then that Peter picked up his pen and wrote, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's a word peculiar to Peter. When he talks about the blood, he calls it the precious blood. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. Do you ever realize how privileged you are? Because you are a Christian, because you've been bought with the price. Oh, precious is the flow, Robert Lowry wrote. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Frank M. Davis said, I am bought not with riches, neither silver nor gold, But Christ has redeemed me, I am safe in his fold. In the book of his kingdom, with his pages so fair, through Jesus my Savior, my name's written there. That's the only way your name gets written there. Oh, my sins, they were many like the sands of the sea, but the blood of my Savior is sufficient for me, for his promise is written in bright letters that glow, though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them like snow. And so when the Passover was instituted, God said, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. God is going to strike the land of America someday. He's going to strike the land of Russia And unless you have the blood not on your house but in your heart, you will perish. The blood of Christ, our Passover lamb, is a sign for us in our hearts. And when God sees the blood of his son covering, that's what the word propitiation means, covering our sins, then the punishment for sin will not fall upon us because it has already fallen on us. Jesus, who became the lightning bolt at Calvary to absorb the wrath of God. That God might demonstrate his love for us. God demonstrates his own love toward us, Paul says, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, 
we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, now follow carefully here, through whom we have now received the atonement or the reconciliation, which leads me to ask a very important question as we draw this to a close. How do we receive the atonement? That the atonement was made is not to be argued. It was once for all. But how do we receive the atonement? Scripture is not silent. Romans 3.25, we accept the atoning sacrifice of Christ, quote, through faith in his blood. Blood is the cleansing agent, but we must believe that it can happen. Amen. Romans 6, 3 and 4, we were buried with Christ through baptism into his death. That's where he shed his blood. I believe it is the point of pardon. Matthew 26, 26 and following, we eat the bread and drink the cup in remembrance of the body that was broken and the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. It's a reminder. That's why we have the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day to remind us that someone died for us. And you need to remember this. Every Lord's Supper is someone's last supper. Sure, you'll take your last supper someday and you won't know that you're doing it. I had the privilege of serving my father his last supper the Lord's Supper. And I think we need to take the Lord's Supper a lot more seriously than we do. Because for, ev for some people, it is indeed their last supper. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Do you ever notice how it's connected with fellowship? It's right there in that verse. Yes, it is. So we receive the atoning sacrifice of Christ through faith in his blood. We prove it when we are buried with him in baptism into his death. We are reminded of every Lord's day at the Lord's table. And when we are in fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Because we're walking in the light, as he is in the light. And he's with his people, and if he's with his people, we're going to be with his people too. Yeah. Robert Bruce of Scotland was leading his men in a battle to gain independence from England. Near the end of the conflict, the English wanted so bad to capture Bruce to keep him from assuming his position as the next in line for the Scottish crown. So they put his own bloodhounds on his trail. When they got close, Bruce, Bruce could hear them baying loudly, and his attendant said, we're done for. They're on your trail. They will reveal your hiding place. But Bruce said, it's all right. He headed for a stream that flowed through the forest. He plunged in and he waded upstream for a short distance. Then he came out on the other bank and he was in the depths of the forest and he was safe within minutes. The hounds tracing their master's steps came to the bank, but they went no farther. The English soldiers urged them on, but the trail was broken. The stream had carried the scent away. A short time later, the crown of Scotland rested on the head of Robert Bruce. And the point is, the memory of our sins, prodded on by Satan, can be like those baying hounds 
But a stream flows red with blood of God's own son, and by grace through faith we are safe. No sin hound can track us down. The precious blood of Christ breaks the trail. Our past may rise up to hunt and to haunt, but it cannot overtake us, for the blood has broken the trail, and we are free from the curse and the penalty of sin. In sin I wandered sore and sad with bleeding heart and aching head till Jesus came and sweetly said, I'll take your sins away. So I gave my heart, my life, my all to him who drank the cup of gall to raise the guilty from the fall and take their sins away. The water, spirit, and the blood agree if we but understood in making sinners pure and good and take their sins away. We cannot know, we may not tell how we are saved from death and hell, but through faith we know that all is well because he took our sins away. Thank God for the blood, thank God for the blood, thank God for the blood that washes white as snow. And all of God's people said,